Today I'm joined once again by Dr. Jens Zimmermann and Pastor Paul van der Klee. Jens is a Christian philosopher and theologian who specializes in hermeneutics and the philosophical and theological roots of humanism. He's currently J.I. Packer, Chair of Theology at Region College in Canada. Paul's a minister in the Christian Reformed Church of North America. He's the pastor of Living Stones in Sacramento in California and a prominent YouTuber offering insightful commentaries and key cultural trends and a rich conversation with everyone from John Peterson and Jonathan Pajot to different randos from around the world. And uh, just to begin then, I want to ask you guys if you have any introductory questions or remarks. Yeah, I just, I'm going to ask just for Paul to introduce himself a little bit because I don't yet know him so well. So he was just starting that when we started recording. So you can just pick up where we left off, I think. It'd be great. Yeah, I... So I grew up, um, so the Christian Reformed Church is very much the part of the Christian Reformed, the Christian Reformed Church kind of has two wings. One would probably be more the confessional pietist wing, the other, the more Kuyperian uh, Christian humanist wing. So I grew up, my father, I'm a third generation Christian Reformed minister. I grew up, my father reading C.S. Lewis, Reformed Journal, um, you know, Alvin Plantinga, Nick Waltersdorf, Richard Mao, these were all heroes of sort of the Dutch Calvinist, Calvin College, Calvin U University tradition. And so I went to Calvin College, got my BA in history, and eventually went on to get uh, my MDiv. Uh, I did overseas missionary service for a while, and then back to North America here in Sacramento, California. And so I Mark recommended after, but you haven't posted my, our conversation with um, Andrew Ruya. That was a great conversation. I'm really looking forward to getting that one out there in the internet. But I, so then Mark said, well, let, let, why, why don't you talk to Jen Zimmerman? I had never heard of your work because we had, we talked about Bart a little bit and then we got on and to Bonhoeffer and that sort of triggered Mark. And what I've so I was very much raised in this sense within Calvin College, the the side of the Christian Reformed Church, very deep, um, deeply within this strain of of Christian humanism, and I, I I think we're I think we're in kind of a crisis of Christian humanism now. Um, right now, the Christian Reformed Church is probably going to have a a battle over same sex marriage that will end it as as we know it, in that um, likely divorce within the denomination, I have no idea what happens to Calvin University, partly because um, the, the, I, I think there is a crisis in Christian humanism in terms of, well, this gets, this, this gets, there, there, same sex marriage has sort of become a web, a wedge issue in the Christian humanist sphere. And, and I can very much understand that because the, the kind of a, a progressive narrative that, that sort of says, well, this, this is what, this is the next step in this progressive narrative versus the other side that says, no, this is a deviation from the long tradition of Christian humanism of being embodied. And, and you see that sort of begin to come apart when you start to hit the conflict over the trans issue. And mm -hmm. so I've, of course, gotten familiar or been familiar with YouTube via Jordan Peterson and that whole area where you have this new sense in cognitive science of, of being embodied. We used to think that we used to think that we were just sort of, you know, embodied ghosts or something in a, in a very rigid <laughs> Cartesian dualism. And I've been having conversations with John Verveke who is a cognitive scientist. And so really a lot of the cutting edge is going on that you can't think without a body. And we knew this because we began to develop, develop machines that we thought were thinking, but now we're seeing well, they're not really thinking, they're computing and mm -hmm. they can't really see. They might be able to record, but seeing involves meaning. You cannot see without meaning because that's actually what filters and directs your world. So 
I've been in this space now for four years, which is kind of a strange thing for a local church pastor to wander into. But I, but I very much do see this us in a moment now as a crisis in, in Christian humanism. And I'll let you explain to everybody what, what on earth we mean by that word. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question, right? I'm not sure um, when you just said that uh, you come up with this Christian humanist reform tradition, that makes sense to me. I, I, um, I got at the, the, the term through Catholic thought. Um, more than that, right? So, I mean, I'm, um, for my introduction, I mean, I became a Christian when I was 18, so I'm a bit of a newbie. I didn't grow up in, in a Christian home and anything like that. Uh, so my whole thought was thoroughly enlightenment, individualistic, um, you know, in the university still. Um, and I just had to learn all of this. And I, I got stuck in Puritan reform thinking because I wanted some kind of a framework. So I was, I was converted in a Pentecostal setting um, and let's just say that it's very lively, but often not very substantive. Um, and so I was looking around and I landed in a Presbyterian church and I started reading, you know, Richard Baxter, Puritans, Calvin. It gave me a framework that I was thirsting for. And then eventually um, I hit this, uh, the, the Nouvelle Theolog Theologians like Henri de Lubac and, and people like that. And they started to talk about Christian humanism in this different sense that I laid out in the, in the stuff that you looked at. Um, so I was just intrigued by the emphasis on the incarnation. Like I hadn't seen that in, in the theology before. It is there in the Puritans, but not in the same uh, way that this is all about God's becoming human. And so we become, you know, little gods or, you know, in terms of our, our moral compass, our virtues, our spirituality, but also our bodies. So the whole thing of immortality as being really, really important. <laughs> that we had lost and we have now regained. And that's our hope because Christ is already at work within us, transforming us and so forth. So this kind of participatory, you know, deeply sacramental dripping with God's presence kind of a theology. I hadn't encountered that before. And, um, and so that I found that really intriguing. And so that's where I, you know, so this phrase, God became human. So we'd become, God or God-like, um, that, that opened up a whole new world for me. And the kind of um, exegetical way that they uh, they would get at that, read the scriptures, right? I mean, if you read, so I, I for the first time in my life, I started reading Irenaeus and Athanasius and Clement of Alexandria and all these church fathers, because I was so intrigued with that trajectory. So you could see that by the time that you can then arrive at the Puritans, you could see a lot of reflections, a lot of echoes are still there in Calvin too. But certainly is not, it wasn't as deep or as rich anymore because of, you know, other influences. Um, so that's where I've, 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 um, so I've come, I've joined you, Paul, in the last four years, probably at the tech um, explanation, right? At this technological level, because I, I realized, like you just implied, that the question, the crisis in humanism or Christian humanism is, is, it's sure to be sure theological, but it comes through another door. It comes through the philosophical buying into that we're basically machines, and the 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 uh, the counter to that, which you which you just mentioned, co embodied cognition. I also encountered that through a, a psychiatrist friend who was part of my project for the last four years, um, and then there's a, a philosopher at UBC, uh, Evan Thompson, who's written a book, Life and Mind. Um, who's also, so he's, he's working through this whole idea, and Hans Jonas has done, this is another philosopher, a German philosopher, who also read as part of this journey, um, but it's this whole idea that our consciousness arises from our biology, so in order to have a conscience, consciousness, well, and conscience, you, you have to have a body, like you have to be a biological entity, you have to be an organism, which means a living being, Whereas the whole tech sector has bought into the dualistic version. So you have, you have the cognitive uh, scientists who have gone over to embodied cognition who say, no, you need a body to have a consciousness and the brain isn't everything and so on and so forth. But you have this other shallower side, which I think most, let me just be uh, polemical here, like most Christians seem to buy into, which is that we're, no, we can, no, consciousness can be disassociated from the body. It doesn't, you don't need to be an organic being. And therefore, all this gender fluidity and all this kind of stuff, right, it all fits into that paradigm. Um, and I think that's really where the crisis, I'm, I'm with you there, where the crisis sits. But it isn't immediately a theological issue. It's, it's, a, 
you know, it's an issue of really <laughs> what kind of beings are we, you know? Yeah. 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 I'm there. Yeah. The it's a interesting. You mentioned Evan Thompson because I've been in, um, I've had quite a bit of dialogue with John Verveke from the university of Toronto who mm -hmm. has done a lot of work. And when you mentioned Evan Thompson, John Verveke is always dropping Evan Thompson's name. I haven't read any Evan Thompson, but it's, it's interesting that there, that's, that, that's that connection. Yeah. So where things have sort of gone in this little corner of the internet, which we talk about between myself, Jonathan Peugeot, John Verveke, Jonathan Peugeot and John Verveke were both um, John Verveke was a colleague and Jonathan Peugeot was a friend of Jordan Peterson's Jordan mm. Peterson in his work sort of broke open a bunch of things on the internet, a bunch of conversations. Now, obviously there's all this culture war stuff, which um, the three of us sort of, that's not our area of interest in terms of the things he's talking about, but much more the, the question of, what is consciousness? Where is it? And in fact, the, the conversation has gotten increasingly strange because what's been interesting over the last couple, over the last year or two, we've also begun talking about higher levels of not human consciousness, but higher, basically principalities and powers. This entire New Testament mapping of which which has sort of been pushed away in the enlightenment, which we're increasingly coming to because mm -hmm. we're looking at the fact that um, we're not quite sure what is directing the world around us. And more and more people who are basically secular are getting a sense that cognition is, isn't anything like we imagined it would be. That for us, it is definitely deeply embodied. Um, you, you cannot really have a mind without a body because actually your mind is distributed throughout your body in many respects, but also human beings also scale up that way. You know, mm -hmm. the apostle Paul of course talks about being in Christ that, that Christ himself is a distributed being in some ways in his church and, 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 and the church then becomes his body. And, and we have the mind of Christ. And, you know, so we've got all of this stuff in this deep, rich Christian tradition, which the Enlightenment sort of shoved away. And the Protestant Reformation, of course, had a piece of that setting mm -hmm. up the Enlightenment as it did. I'm just I'm just throwing stuff out there. And um, I don't know, maybe Mark will bring some order to this crazy conversation. It's <laughs> it's it's just that. What what has been opening up in in the last four years, it seems much of the church is completely innocent of or ignorant of. And it, it's something that I think a lot more Christian academics could would find themselves well-equipped to engage in, mm -hmm. yeah, but I, I don't know if they know that the mm -hmm. conversation is happening. I'll say it yeah, way. yeah. No, I I agree with you. Um, and this could bring us back more to what maybe Mark had in mind. But I mean, that part of the reason is that some some in in the academic circles, at least in the in a sort of Christian college scene or whatever, they're still um, you know they're focused in terms of hermeneutics more still on the interpretation of scripture and so on, than rather than on a broader sense of hermeneutics. Like, what is our historical you know, sort of um, consciousness that we have developed with which we approach reality, they're not really looking at that much, you know, and so that doesn't even filter into their way of reading the scriptures, let alone in what it means to be a human being. And, and so, you know, they just, I don't think they've recognized the battlefront, frankly. No. And that's, and that needs to change. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd very much agree with that. The, the church, you know, when the Jordan Peterson thing broke open, I saw this and thought, wow, this is a tremendous opportunity for the mm -hmm. church to actually reopen conversations with the world quite a bit more broadly. Mm -hmm. And the church sometimes just doesn't seem interested. It's interested in their own little conversations, even while, you know, you know, especially in Canada, 
I mean, the numbers of people who are actually participating regularly in church life in Canada are quite a bit smaller than they are in the United States. And I don't, you know, Ireland, you guys are, you guys are writing your own story out there. I don't know what's going on. Mm. Unfortunately so. So I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think basically what I want to do then this evening, moving on from what we've described with those uh, general points about Christian humanism is to look more specifically at Dietrich Bonhoeffer and um, Jens's book on his Christian humanism and see how, if that can convey some important lessons for today that I think are in line with what you're both talking about. So I want to ask just first of all, Jens, what did you hope to convey in your book about Bonhoeffer and um, that we haven't seen elsewhere, I suppose, in Bonhoeffer scholarship and what, I suppose, marks his Christian humanism? Yeah, I'll, and I'll try to repress my, you know, I, mean, I just wanted to write a book about Bonhoeffer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and uh, as I said in the foreword, like who needs another book on Bonhoeffer? But um, this Christian humanism idea that I just um, uh, introduced with, uh, with Paul, um, I saw that uh, throughout Bonhoeffer's works. I mean, I spent, um, before, I, before I wrote the book, I spent, you know, about 10, 12 years uh, reading Bonhoeffer and there's lots of stuff that fascinates me about him but it was always something else then I mean he was popular in evangelical circles you know as a devotional writer and then I mean he resists the Nazis he's, he got risked his life for all of that but I always thought they missed Bonhoeffer the theologian uh, in all of that um, and his theology is is thoroughly grounded in the incarnation so in this kind of Christian humanist sense um, right, that everything has to be strung up from, oh, he'd call it Christology or I'd call it incarnational Christology, but from the Christ event um, in terms of our knowledge, in terms of how language works, in terms of how we uh, interpret our experiences. So he's, he's quite sophisticated in these things. Um, so, so, so I wanted to see how he fits with that incarnational thinking into the greater tradition. And so I, I wanted to, I wanted to, Dietrich Bonhoeffer to meet the patristics kind of thing. And, and, and I found out that, well, actually Bonifer was, was steeped in the patristics. He just never mentions it. There's, there's only a couple of people who have written on this. Um, and it was clear that through Adolf von Harnack, like his, his uh, you know, this famous theologian and teacher, like they were reading primary patristic texts in a, in, a, in a seminar. So, you know, in Greek, obviously they were doing, and Bonifer was very enamored with this and he wanted to continue that after Harnack's death. I don't think they ever pulled it off, but nobody knows. Um, so what I realized is, and this will make sense to, to both of you, I don't know, to our audience, but the kind of notion of recapitulation and Irenaeus um, and other things that Bonifer just kind of seems to take over and use in his own way. And if you know both writers, you could totally see that. I was like, that's Irenaeus. Like, yeah, that's totally from there. Um, but he doesn't give sources. Um, he, he does in some of his earlier works, he cites Augustine a fair bit and so on. But on, on the whole, he just kind of absorbs the stuff and uses it. Um, and so I just wanted to basically show how, how closely Bonifer sort of rides this, you know, what I call a patristic humanist tradition um, and, and to bring that out and to put him into that sort of larger tradition and in some ways contrast him with Karl Barth, who, while having many good things, sort of lacks the sacramental side of things which Bonifer as a Lutheran is thoroughly into and which kind of links and then again to the patristic uh, scholars especially um, as it centers on the Eucharist as I you know we can talk about that more as a central sort of a center of this Christian humanism right the the, the Lord's table or whatever one wants to call it um, anyway that was the motivation to just put him into the larger tradition and to show his uh, kinship really with with the early church's incarnational Christological reading of of all of reality, really. Mm. Thank you, Jens. And how then, uh, Paul, does that resonate with your experiences reading Bonhoeffer and maybe what you found most insightful about him and his work? Well, I, I, I have to confess that, you know, when he describes how evangelical sort of appropriated Bonhoeffer devotionally, that's that was very much my interaction with Bonhoeffer um, in college and seminary. I first started reading him. And then, you know, a number of years ago, um, um, Metaxas, of course, wrote that biography of Bonhoeffer, and I, I was reading through it, and I just thought, this doesn't sound like 
someone in, you know, he just kind of made him sound like an, an evangelical. And I thought, That's right. eh, I'm not quite sure you can really do that to him. And that's, I read some reviews on him from other Bonhoeffer scholars. And a lot of people are a little bit horrified. It's like, oh, here's this guy. Let's make him sound like us. Uh, that's probably, I, I know enough history to know that wasn't it. You know, Bonhoeffer's story is is obviously compelling, and and for me, compelling. I, I didn't I didn't mention too much about where I grew up. So my father, you know, my I'm a third generation Christian foreign minister. My father took a what was in CRC terminology a chapel, which was sort of like a mission station among African Americans in Patterson, New Jersey, just outside of New York, and um, really in the '60s and '70s, sort of helped that group turn a corner to become a church. And, and so that was the context in which I grew up. And of course, Bonhoeffer had this transformative experience with the African-American community in, in North America. You know, that is known. The, I, I think where, and I remember reading Cost of Discipleship, which had a profound impact on me when I was in seminary. Um, I found the book just, um, you know, deeply moving, very transformative. But, you know, anybody who knows any, history of theology knows that in the in the middle in the early mid 20th century in in Germany and Europe you've got this real struggle as to whether or not Christianity can sort of be saved from the enlightenment and in many respects there's all sorts of efforts to 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 on one hand go along with the Enlightenment and say, well, all of these assumed historical things, they no longer hold. So then we want to have this other nature of Christian truth that is disconnected from history or kind of crunchy reality. And so you'll get you'll get Schleiermacher and you've get this whole history of liberalism. And of obviously what you get from from Bart is this sort of um, oh gosh, how did I, I just started, I, I just started reading Bart recently because I'm in the book of Romans and, you know, it's sort of God out of nowhere, just exploding with Bart and, and Bonhoeffer seemingly, again, as you said, and what you're, what you're saying now makes a lot of sense, really trying once again to connect God to this world that we all participate in. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so yeah, I'm, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't really dug into your book yet, but I'd, I'd very much like to hear more about how Bonhoeffer went about that, because what's happening now in the circles that I see, people, of course, get very interested in Jordan Peterson, and then they often wind up as Orthodox or Roman Catholics, mm -hmm. which to me made a world of sense, because again, what they're really getting into is, is once again, more of a sacramental reality. Mm -hmm. And whereas when I came to Sacramento mm -hmm. in the late 90s, church planters were planting churches using sort of a seeker movement ethos out of Bill Hybels or Rick Warren. And almost all of those churches have transitioned now into what I call a, a neo-sacramental worship style with more emphasis on sacraments, more emphasis on liturgy, more emphasis of, of embodiment. You'll find Christian Reformed churches having Ash Wednesday services, which when I was growing up in the 1970s, <laughs> you know, that would have got you in trouble. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I'm curious how, how Bonhoeffer then, sounds like fairly early on, he began to sense that this was a profitable route for us to turn to, to once again, reground Christianity in this, in this material world. Yeah, I think so. Like I, you know, if you survey his um, work and you know, there's a lot of debate about continuity, discontinuity in Bonhoeffer, but when you, then his first dissertation written at, you know, incredibly young age, um, Sanctorum Communio, the book on the church, and it was, I mean, after that, he had some, some sort of a conversion experience um, that Metaxas makes a lot of, but if you're not into sort of evangelical conversion theories, then you could just say it was a deepening of a faith that was already there, but there certainly was a change, and it had to do with this trip to the States, uh, I'm sure. 
But even in Sanctum Communion before that, it basically, I mean, if you want to boil it down, is you can't be a Christian without being tied into um, the church because it's the body of Christ. And the church itself is obviously made up of human beings who therefore have sociological connections and structures that can be explained sociologically. However, sociology cannot explain the church because it's ultimately a theological um, you know, and a spiritual entity, but it nonetheless is rooted in the sociology and the biology of people. So there are, there are dynamics that are shared, but the church always exceeds these because of Christ's presence in them. And that's sort of what he does in that remarkable work. And you can see how Bard has influenced him. I mean, he was deeply inspired by Bard. And to be a little bit more charitable, I mean, what Bart does is, if you remember the preface to Romans, I was impressed of his, uh, which is what got him his fame initially, um, the dismantling of the historical critical school, right? The right. Showing that, okay, you guys think you're doing neutral exegesis? Well, you're not. <laughs> yeah. And now we kind of go, yeah, that's old hat. We all know that. But back then, it was pretty cool. And to do that against somebody like Harnack, who just wouldn't understand uh, and wouldn't see what Bart is actually doing. Um, but you're right. I mean, he then, then, and then that opens the ground for God to simply speak. And and Bonifer actually, in uh, later on in his ethics, he has this remarkable passage where he says, "Well, you know, I'm somewhere between Boltman and Bart. Like I, with Bart, I think God needs to speak, but Boltman is right because Boltman actually recognized the hermeneutical problem here. Right? We are there's there's past and present horizons that need to be fused. We are, damn it, 21st or 20th century people." you know, light bulb and electricity people, like how do we connect to an archaic ancient world? And Bart just says, believe, right? <laughs> and, yep. and Boltman says, well, no, demythologize. And Boniface says, but that, both of them are wrong. Like I want to be somewhere in the middle. And he never got to write his book on hermeneutics that he wanted to, but it would have been really fascinating. I assume that he would have landed somewhere in a kind of Jordan Peterson, Paul Ricoeur kind of a thing where you know, like myths really matter, but what, how, how does a, a mythology work? Like, what is it that you get? Like, he, Bonifer did not want to go behind the words, let's say, of the Genesis narrative to demythologize them, but realizing that these are, you know, archaic symbols and so on, um, but that in their primitiveness actually convey a true reality that you don't get behind. Right. You don't dissolve it. You let it speak to you, right? This kind of a stuff. Really fascinating. But yeah, but actually your question, I think he sensed early on, and that's his Lutheranism, uh, that, you know, God has sunk the church, um, you know, uh, or his presence has sunk into the realities of the created world and of our biological, you know, the stuff of reality and, um, and is deeply making his way and working through that. Um, and that is just at the heart of his whole, uh, all of his theology. And that, that makes him so attractive, I think, to me. So, I mean, God's presence is there. You can't reduce it to these realities, but it works through these realities. And therefore, one of his um, famous uh, uh, lines from the ethics is that our knowledge has to be patterned according to the pattern of the incarnation. So if God becomes human and we need to interpret that, he interprets himself through Christ, right, who reveals God and who is God, but we see this human being that we then need to interpret. Our whole knowledge has to follow that. So the the the, the sacred is uh, found in the secular, the rational and the spiritual. You can't reduce one to the other, um, but that's how God shows himself to us, right, until another day. And so uh, that that was deeply hermeneutical, deeply incarnational, and I think it's it, there's a humility there that is helpful. So and that's why you get this whole wrestling of what God's will is, which is already in discipleship, uh, but it's very strong in Bonhoeffer. Um, and yet he's determined that you can know it, you know, in some ways. And that's your whole effort. And then if you act on it in the end, you can say, I knew exactly what God wanted. But because in hindsight, like who knows but God, how all the ramifications of your right. decisions. But you have to wrestle with this and try to come to a knowledge of what seems to be what should be God's concrete command in the present day. Like he wouldn't let go of that. Like he wants that kind of clarity. And yet when you have it and you act and he says, but that act, I surrender to God's merciful judgment because none of us finite creatures can know ultimately, nor should we, because then we turn ourselves into God because only he can know ultimately what the ramifications of our actions are. Like that's his, I, I just found that really true. <laughs> you know, that's just how it seems to be like how we know things. Anyway.
Mm, excellent. Thank you, Jens. And I suppose, Paul, then, uh, what lessons can a pastor and a, can a local church take away from this kind of Christian witness? And how might it apply to our 21st century concerns, especially in kind of internet age and the things that we were describing before? Part of what, when, when you're a pastor of a local church, you're usually having to deal with people on the various levels that they're at. And I often talk about the fact that here on YouTube, we're in this very thinky talky space. Mm. And, you know, in a conversation like this, we can talk about a, you know, a mid 20th century theologian that probably some of the people listening to us, you know, might have read something from Bonhoeffer, probably the most, fa the most famous thing about him was that he was killed by the Nazis, which gives him, you know, credibility in our culture. But, right. but most people, most people in a local church are busy about, they're busy about their lives, they're busy about their jobs, they're busy about their children, they're busy about their health. And there's something, there's something very grounding about a local church. And when, you know, when my channel started taking off, people sort of expected that I would, um, that, that the local church is sort of a, you know, th those who, um, those who can't teach preach, let's say, um, hmm. because that's the, you know, if, if you know, you're, the local church is just sort of this basic work. And if you have any skills at all, you'll, you'll, you'll climb up the ladder and you'll no longer be having to deal with members of the church who are grieving their dead dog or the fence that we're trying to put up or, you know, all of the, all of the nitty gritty things within a real church. Mm. But what I, what I like about, you know, what we're talking about and what I, what, I, what I saw in Bonhoeffer is that these, these matters in real people's lives, this is the locale in which God is present. Mm -hmm. and, and part of this hierarchy that we sort of establish with attention, with YouTube, with YouTube subscribers or internet followers or Twitter followers, whatever way we're sort of climbing a ladder in the culture to larger and larger audiences, is the reality of this locale gets lost. But it is, in fact, in this locale that God speaks and works. And, and part of that is true because all of these people climbing this hierarchy, whether they're, they're always on tour talking to large groups of people, if they're always on these, these screens that we're at, they too participate in this. And if there's anything that you might learn from watching um, Amber Heard and... Um, don't shoot, why can't I think of the darn guy's name? Oh, the Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, <laughs> If you if you if you're watching this this lawsuit where they're both dragging out the details of his drug use and his drunkenness and his his jealousy and her assaults on him and her demeaning and verbal abuse of him and sometimes hitting him. Um, yeah, you know what? This is, in fact, the level at which we are all participating and this is, in fact, the level in which Christ's redemptive work becomes flesh in our lives between each other. I've often told people that I think a close reading of the New Testament, absolutely the Holy Spirit is within us, but in the church, the Holy Spirit is mostly between us. And it's at this level of daily life where the invasion of God in our world really becomes flesh. Hmm. Yeah, that's. I think that's really good. That reminds me, um, Paul, of, um, and I, I think Mark was going to ask this uh, question at some point. But for for Bonner, for the the whole I, the whole problem with the self, the whole problem with you know um, who we are is, and it just triggered this what you just said, Paul, that uh, the the Holy Spirit's at work within us. But what that is could be so subjective unless it is it is tested by the in between, right? Um, and that's what Bonhoeffer recognized that very early, um, that the human self and our consciousness needs a border, needs a limit 
Um, so and only when it bounces up against that limit um, do, do our sort of uh, does our navel gazing stop? Does our inverted self and curved self is forced to look up? Is forced to uh, you know be impacted by by the other to use that uh, you know trendy term? Um, and of course, God is the ultimate um, other. But it's one another who is that limit. And if we objectify the other person, or if we try to interpret them with, in line with our own subjective experience, uh, that's a problem. And to me, that's a problem with the internet because it's so much easier to do that on, like on an internet connection, right? On the screen, the, the way we portray ourselves to one another than it is when you're in the body beside the other person within a certain social context, right? So much, so much harder there. Um, but so for Bonifer, it was all about the self needs to lose itself, needs to be opened up, turned away from itself towards something, I mean, ultimately to God, um, so that you get ripped out of the self-absorption, which we now seem to celebrate, and which turns what could be a, a healthy confession of our brokenness and sins into this kind of mud flinging um, you know, that you've just described and which then people feast on, which is even more grotesque. Yeah. Anyway, I, that's, I, yeah. I, I often talk about one of the things that I notice in people is this, they imagine that their self, I call it the secret sacred self, because mm. it's, it's, I have to go in and I have to discover all of these things about myself. And it's like, Okay, we, we certainly need to we certainly need to have introspection and to and to see ourselves through the eyes of others. But it's not that our self is somehow way deep down in this rather gnostic place that is disconnected from your parents, your context, your address, your teachers. I mean, in in a sense, part of what happened in modernity is that God sort of gets lost because we begin to recognize that we are formed mm -hmm. creatures through history. And, and what seems to come around after that is more the realization that the, the God of redemption is also the God of creation, and that you meet God through the processes that have formed you. Mm -hmm. And instead of divinizing those processes as such, you begin to understand that this is all part of a far, far larger narrative and that yourself isn't this secret sacred thing which is somehow disconnected from your story. Your, your story is the flourishing of that, but you also have agency in that story for mm -hmm. its redemption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, precisely, yeah. Excellent, thank you, you guys. And then um, next I wanna ask you both about something that seems to come across in both of your works is the interaction with orthodox thinkers, theologians, and of different stripes, I suppose. So um, I want to ask about some of the emphases maybe that we find in orthodoxy, which uh, I think are very to the forefront of Jens's work, that patristic kind of emphasis on the deification and um, things like that that we see in Jonathan Pajot and Father John Burr, for example, who I know you've both sort of come across. I want to ask, why do you think there is that um, pull, as you describe it, towards orthodoxy, Paul? And um, I wonder how you see that sort of playing out with, even Father John Barr seems to be something of a kind of superstar in academia, I suppose. I don't know. Um, I want to wonder why that might be as well, yes. Does that uh, make you want me to... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go, Paul, you go first. I, I like listening to you. You go first, and then I'll see what, what you haven't yet said. <laughs> I, I don't know the the whole orthodox thing was a complete surprise to me hmm. i you know so i was raised in you know a Christ, a christian reformed church our theological education had tended to be well here here these are all the way that the catholics are wrong and we're right oh okay um the orthodox got almost no press and and church fathers got very little press. And that was obviously part of the context of, um, you know, everything that, that came to be in terms of the Christian Reformed Church in the, in the middle of the 20th century. As I, you know, when I first went, so before I had found Jordan Peterson, I had been reading quite a bit of C.S. Lewis, and I was reading his book, Miracles, because I, I realized that in church, 
with a Genesis, let's say a generous Genesis cosmology where you have a dome um, and you've got the earth is on pillars. And so we talk about this in church, but then the people leave church and we're on a sphere going around another sphere. And, you know, I, it really came to me one year when I basically skipped Ascension Day. And one of the members of my church said, you know, you skipped Ascension Day. And I thought, that's interesting. Why did I skip Ascension Day? Why, why isn't the Ascension of Christ very salient to me? And, and that began a, you know, this, this, you know, very typical, you know, Bart goes into a local church, uh, Abram Kuyper goes into a local church, and suddenly these, these pesky members who have been formed by their tradition say, hey, wait a minute, pastor, uh, this is a basic thing that you're simply overlooking. Well, what on earth does Ascension Day mean? And I start, you know, pondering C.S. Lewis's book, Miracles, over and over and thinking about symbol and, and what symbols point to and how words work. And then Jordan Peterson comes along, and I, I had no idea what I was listening to when I was listening to him. I had no background in Jung or, or any of this stuff, but that sort of opens up this canal by which we, we try to put the world back together. And, and that then led to more Roman Catholic theologians, um, uh, my friend uh, Brett Sockold and his really his wonderful book, Transubstantiation, whereby I begin to realize, you know, Calvin, Calvin's real presence really isn't that far away from transubstantiation, even though I, I just didn't understand what transubstantiation was. And in his book, he sort of argues that Luther was trying to get there too, but Luther wasn't really understanding Aquinas because there's too much separation there. And that leads me to this, this whole trail by which eventually I, I want to be able to have a cosmology that is whole again mm -hmm. and to, to be able to understand Genesis neither as sort of a modernist sweeping it away. Oh, those silly people thought we lived under a dome. And, and, and at the same time, understanding, well, did Christ ascend? What did that mean? What are the implications of this ascension? And, and then I began to notice that people, you know, all these church planters were Oh, let's let's remember our let's remember our baptism and let's have an Ash Wednesday service. And it's like they're not necessarily putting the pieces together, but they are actually acting out this new sacramentalizing of the world. And that that is in fact, I think, where the church is going and discovering that. Well, church fathers had dealt with this a very long time ago and have a great amount to contribute to us. Now, traditions like mine, which tended to be iconoclastic, would sort of sweep them away, but that's kind of ending. And, and, and we're now in a space where Protestants are on one hand saying there were real reasons why we had to protest what was what the state of the Roman Catholic Church and the in the 15th and 16th century, yet at some point, the protest is going to have to end. And for it to end, in some ways, Orthodox and Catholics are gonna to have to figure out why there was a Reformation and an Enlightenment. And Protestants are gonna to have to figure out maybe some of what we threw away and what we need to get back in touch with. So that's, that's sort of how I see the times right now. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, for me, it was um, it wasn't a well, it was a surprise the other way around. Like I didn't even know really what orthodoxy was supposed to be. Like, I mean, I've heard the word, and I just started reading the Church Fathers, and then um, increasingly students asked me whether I was Catholic or Orthodox, just the way I talked, <laughs> and uh, I didn't understand that either so much, right? But I mean, now in hindsight, I would say, uh, Paul, some of the things that you've said, I mean, I was theologically quite naive, and I guess you're shaped in a certain way. And what did come together for me is that, you know, the redeemer God is the creator God, like the, the typical split that is made. 
And so if, if, I, if I can do an Augustinian take, what I was always after <laughs> is, uh, is the cosmic Christ, you know? Like, so, and then I found that, a description of it, I saw it in the Fathers, and I found in a good sort of, um, can't call it an updated, but in modern language, Boniface um, notion, because he came to that. He came to the realization when he was writing his ethics that he wants to talk about ethics that can be, and I don't think there was in his theology, but conceptually there can't be any room for dualism. And so he starts off ethics, or at least we believe that's the sort of one of the major first parts with uh, this description of the one Christ reality. So, I mean, basically from Colossians, right? Christ is the one in whom everything hangs together. For him, this was like a huge, uh, if not a discovery, but said, if I want to do ethics, I have, ethics has to be based on what reality is like. So ethics needs a metaphysics. And what reality is, is Christ. Christ is the center of reality. And so, again, it's the cosmic Christ of the Father. So the, the, in, the incarnation uh, encompassing, you know, all the three, like God's becoming a human being, then he lives and fulfills the law and resists sin and so on and so forth. And then he dies and nails and then he ascends. Like all of that is the work of the incarnation for Bonhoeffer. Um, th that, that changes that changes all of reality. I mean, the, the world is now reconciled to God in Christ, and out of that, we should live. But that means you also, you don't just pay attention to the Redeemer God, but to all of creation. And so it's, it's Bonhoeffer who actually recovers also in ethics, um, you know, what you might want to call, he doesn't call, he calls it the natural, but it's really natural law for Protestants after they've lost the tradition, um, because he's so convinced that Christ is the center of all of reality. That means all all of reality is what that means, you know? Um, and so that, that to me, um, that's again, where Bonifer meshes with the, uh, the sort of sacramental and really ultimately Eucharistic character of, um, of patristic theology. And, and the one thing that, that I also came to realize is even if you're a reformed Protestant who sort of missed out on all of that, uh, or is just echoes still has echoes from that, um, like, where did we get the creeds from? Who were those guys, you know, that wrote these creeds? <laughs> what theology made them write these, you know, come up with these creedal formulations? Well, that's like the first four, 500 years of the church, right? So they couldn't have just made this up. I'm sure they believed they were faithful to Paul and the scriptures. <laughs> you know? And it, it just, it occurred to me, there really is that sort of bizarre split where you have the New Testament, which we read and exegete, you know, and then there's nothing. And then Luther came back and brought the gospel to light. And like in between, it's just the Holy Spirit took kind of a vacation or something. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's that's crudely put. But in many ways, I think at an operative level, that's how a lot of people function. Right. So, yeah. I mean, I have very good theologians. I know they in Protestant circles, they start with Calvin and Luther. Like that's where theology starts. And everything else is maybe a short reference to Augustine. you got to read the Confessions. But who rolled our theology really in the first five six hundred years? <laughs> it's yeah. not. It's not there, right? So well, anyway, that that was sort of my experience. So maybe surprised the other way around. I was like, okay, I guess I'm, I'm. Uh, if that's what orthodoxy is, the, the one of the problems I had with orthodoxy always had is, and I don't know, maybe Mark, you know more about this. Um, is there seems to have been more of a church-state collusion automatically since the, you know, early days. So. That was we just saw Putin at Easter. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but I mean, yeah, that's all, that's, that's my ode to uh, orthodoxy. Well, and I think, you know, actually that, that little, that video that I saw of yours with a, with a, I think, I think it was a Catholic organization and you touched on the Trinity in there. And I know that, um, you know, from some of the things that I've seen, you really want to get into again, some of the, the consciousness, the cognition, some of those kinds of issues. E one thing that I, when I listened to you in that video, I almost made, took a little clip out of it because it's what I do on my channel. I'll take a little clip and then I'll throw it up on my channel and then I'll talk about it. But, but the, I, I hadn't, for some reason, of course, how, how many times have I read about the Trinity in my, you know, 30 years of being a minister, but the 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 subtle dance of trinitarian theology and now it gets it gets terribly philosophical very quickly in Pretty terms funny. of yeah. persons and persons and so on and so forth but the you know where things are going now 
in terms of persons and what persons are and how we are persons. I, I think I think a lot of that stuff might come around again because we're we're also beginning to see how in an enlightenment individualist materialist frame, we imagine persons to be covered with skin. And, um, you know, here I've got this location right now in Sacramento, California. But but actually, you know, Augustine is still with us. And, um, you know, the church father sort of haunted theology behind the scenes. And I, I expect with the with the rise of the machines, and, um, you know, the Turing test in terms of our questions about Am I talking to a person on the other end of this phone or on the other end of this machine? I, I expect we're going to see a revival of some of the, the basic conversations that came into this, um, what at least in my little corner of the world, because I've got biblical Unitarians and Jews. Mm. And you know, so the Trinity is once again a hot topic in my world, which surprised me quite a bit. But, but this question of, okay, well, what are we as persons? We're certainly embodied, and, and that embodied cognition is deeply important, but there are, <laughs> that, that's, that's, I think, really where we're heading. And, and so I, I think a lot of this basic work that was done to set up our creeds is going to suddenly become something more than just a class on Christology that someone took at seminary. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Um, I mean, I've done some of uh, some reading around that, um, but it's true. I think that's the, the the way I would formulate it. Is there what does it mean to be a, a hypostasis of this human nature? Right. I mean, that's really the question and you can't reduce that to anything really it's a mystery in the end and people don't like that word either but um but that's really the question and it gets us back to the beginning of our conversation i think unless the church begins to realize that and how we've distorted that mystery by buying into us as basically clever machines that you can enhance um then then the game's up well and, and the fact that we are i mean mark will know this from my channel we, we, we are, we're not even clever machines sometimes. We're non-player characters that are mouthing scripts given to us by yes. entities <laughs> above us that we're not terribly cognizant of. And we're partly willfully blind to because of the, the philosophical assumptions that are, are been roaming around since the enlightenment. That in yeah. fact, spirits are not inhabiting us and, and having us do their bidding and yeah. suddenly, when you have a frame like that, a lot of the New Testament sort of comes to life again in terms yeah. of how Paul frames what exactly is it that Christ did on the cross yeah. in the, described in the book of Colossians. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. I, I, I agree with that. And I often picture the Internet and the, the kind of media, social media influence and the way that, you know, we become sort of these, these um, marionettes of language and so on. It's almost like the, the Garden of Eden temptation scene without, without the tension in it, right? It's almost like, uh, you know how, I mean, many Milton, John Milton, others, many have, 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 have sort of put this, and, and C.S. Lewis has done a great job of putting this into fictional details and stories, but the tension is always Satan has to try to make the first human beings, try to make them think for themselves, but really think in a way that is contrary to God's will. Well, if you leave out the try to think for yourselves part, then, then that's where we are today, right? There's always like Satan will go, the snake will go, and this is really good to eat. And, and Eve will say, yeah, this is really good to eat. You know, that's, that's basically what you're looking at. They, they, not even the subtlety of, of perverting critical self-thought uh, is anymore on the menu, you know? That's, yeah. that's sheer propaganda, which is frightening. And, and we're so... It, it, and you know, we're so prone to it, we're, which, which we just fall right into it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. yeah, I know. It's crazy. So then um, I suppose, Jens, to take us back down to earth, then what role does the Eucharist play in this kind of um, incarnate Christian humanism that you describe? 
and how was this expressed in um, Bonhoeffer's work and uh, even in his life, I suppose? Um, well, obviously the, 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 the Eucharist, you know, as, as a Thanksgiving and part is for me, the, the Thanksgiving and participation in the new creation, right? I mean, if you believe in a new and a true sense and a, and a real presence, what you're participating in is the new reality of, of the new creation. I mean, that's how I see it. And, and, um, actually one of, um, one of my pastors once unwittingly, I think he really he really got the right point. I mean, it's not just new creation, but it's new. So the new creation has come about through the perfect human being. So God uses humanity um, to redeem all of creation. And people often, when you say that, it's, oh, you're privileging the human being. You should be, you know, you should be emphasizing creation itself and so on and so forth. I said, well, <coughs> fine, you can do that. I'm just going by scripture here. So, I mean, obviously God chose fit for a human being uh, to redeem creation. So what, you know, and this is what I love about Orthodox, I go back to that, this whole story, which C.S. Lewis also picks up and repristinates and works through, is that creation was supposed to be tended to and given back to God through the human being that was the you know, representative of God in creation, but we didn't do that. And so we lost, you know, we didn't fulfill the, the great task that God has entrusted to us. And so Christ has to come, he becomes the priestly figure that gives creation back to God. He does our job for us, which we could have done had we not fallen. Um, I think it's a very strong theme in C.S. Lewis. I actually thought the other day, rereading that stuff, that C.S. Lewis is almost like a, a, a hymn to deification. It's like the whole, you know, these, the, the space trilogy. Um, and, and so that's what we experience in the Eucharist is, you know, we, 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 are, we are fed by the flesh and blood of Christ in a real sense, participating in the new creation. And for me, that is a, a God's gracious giving us a tangible uh, hope that, you know, we can talk about his working in us and so on and so forth. But we're here actually ingesting something that says Christ is in you, is at work in you. Um, and I think because that's a reality, therefore, um, the reality to our neighbor, right, our communion and unity with our neighbor is so stressed in all of this, like you shouldn't be partaking of the supper if you're if you really have issues or anger issues or, or disruption of the community, which is part of the new creation, is the unity of humanity. I mean, that's, those things are taken very seriously, I think, especially by the early community. Um, and so that's how I see the Eucharist. So this, this pastor, this reformed pastor, unwittingly said, you know, when you take the bread and the wine, uh, really all of humanity should stand at this altar and participate in this. You know, every, every human being should be here and experiencing this union and this joy. Um, and now he didn't tie that to deification, didn't tie that to the, all of this theology, but I think that's really part of this, right? And it's with, with that eschatological anticipation um, that we should partake in the Eucharist. And that's really the hope that I will rise, you know, hence the importance of the ascension also, um, and so on and so forth. And I think we, like in Protestantism, I mean, Paul can correct me here if it depends on the, I'm sure on the uh, denomination um, but we tend to reduce the Eucharistic celebration to a kind of memorial, a commiseration, you know, a, a feeling very strongly sorrowful for our sins and, and sort of glad that Christ died for our sins. But it's all about that rather than the life to come. And I know the creeds end on that we're looking forward to the world, the life to come. That's really what, what this inculcates for me, right? And this is why when I come out of the, the church having participated in Eucharist and you, you walk into the world, which is God's world, but which is fallen, like all the crap right down to the deadly disease um, is relativized by, by this reality that I've just ingested. Right. I, I just, I, so I think the churches that have the Eucharist every Sunday, they are onto something. <laughs> I think they're, you know, they know that this is sustaining. Ooh. Anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's sort of my sh short spiel on that. Yeah, yeah, and would you like to add to that, Paul? Or? Well, I again, one of the things that I've noted, unfortunately, my church hasn't gone there yet. I, just partly by the by virtue of the church, but almost all of these churches that started out as seeker churches have eventually all gone to uh, all gone to weekly communion, and the I, I, I think we will I think we will see. I think that the participation in the Eucharist 
will be for a lot of churches sort of the uh, a re-understanding of that sort of a foundation for them to begin to increasingly understand how Christ renovates the world through mm-hmm. history. Yeah. We say that, but again, this we sort of flip into this Cartesian dualism where spirit is immaterial and, and just up there. And then from there, it's just a sort of sh- short step to a merely psychological, whereas right. like someone right. with, you know, I've been following the work of Tom Holland um, out of the UK. I don't know if you've read his book, Dominion. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, what, what I'm finding in, in this, what I think is going to be, I really do believe we're going to see a new wave of, of Christian conversions, probably similar to something that, that was seen in the 1930s around Lewis, because Lewis wasn't alone in that group. But, you know, after the First World War of a, a new group sort of coming into the faith, I, I think we're going to see another one now where we see that Christ, in fact, did, you know, did do the work that he said he was doing when he did it. And we just simply haven't had eyes to see it. And, mm-hmm. and in a lot of my preaching lately, I've, I've tried to, you know, show the congregation that how Christ, you know, took captive and led in triumphal procession, the principalities and powers has in fact been going on over the last 2000 years. Mm-hmm. And now certainly the church has, you know, no, nobody, no pastor is ever going to sort of paint the church, see the church through rose colored glasses. You can't do that as a pastor because you see all of the messiness along the way. You see the pet, the, um, the, the, the pettiness, you see the inability, you see the shortcomings. We see these in our own lives, but we see that in fact, Christ did completely remake the story in an astounding way. Now it took a long amount of time, mm-hmm. but I remember noticing this in, you know, reading the the letters to the churches in Asia Minor at the beginning of the book of Revelation and contemplating that, you know, towards the end of the first century, saying these kind of things to struggling tiny little groups that they will overcome is absolutely crazy because they are tiny little struggling groups that are beset by the larger Greco-Roman pagan culture. They're beset by their rivalry with um, with other Jewish groups. And everyone would imagine they're just going to disappear. But within a few hundred years, you're going to have Constantine and things are just going to keep rolling. And now we get to this point where a, a secular scholar looks back and says, the more I understand the Greco-Roman world, the more I see that it was completely overturned by this guy who, you know, was hung outside of Jerusalem and his disciples say they saw him alive and he ascended. And that guy has changed all of human history. Hmm. And on one hand, we can't account for it. On the other hand, you know, it's not merely psychological. And we're living in it. And so then suddenly through the sacrament, all sorts of new things seem to come popping up and we're seeing it now. Mm, Excellent. Thank you, Paul. I think uh, it's most exciting to actually just in my my news uh, letter today from Dr. Vishal Mangalwadi. Uh, who wrote that book about how the Bible made a uh, Western civilization or just civilization generally? He's going to be on Jordan Peterson now. So I thought that was like he's somewhat similar to Dominion that, that book, but that's an incredible platform for someone like him to be on and what kind of fruit that might bear. It's quite mm-hmm. interesting. And then uh, there's another conversation recently. I don't know if you saw it, Paul, but uh, on Rebel Wisdom between Paul Kingsnorth and Mary Harrington. Yeah, that's a awesome. very interesting conversation. So I want to just touch upon that, actually, because Jens has written some fantastic stuff about transhumanism, and um, I'm currently reading Thomas Fuchs' um, book on the kind of embodied consciousness that you were talking about previously. Oh, okay. Good on you, yeah. 
<laughs> because of your Christian flourishing website, Jens, so that's fantastic. And I know Paul would love that book too. But um, I think he deserves a, a, a platform too, actually. So I'm glad that you're offering it. But uh, even in this kind of little corner that the internet, Paul describes. So hopefully we can bring him in at some stage, uh, with, even with somebody like Verbecki, as you say, Paul. But I want to go, back, go to that conversation with um, Mary and uh, Paul, because they describe the kind of neo-Gnostic um, anti-humanism that's at the heart of that kind of transhuman effort now. And uh, I want to pick your brain a bit about, and your mind a bit about this, um, Jens, how what we're describing contrasts with that kind of anti-humanist messaging. And um, I suppose to what extent is it neo-Gnostic uh, as uh, in contrast to the, the previous Gnosticism? Because I think in uh, Del Noche, he seems to describe it, I don't want to butcher this, but that uh, instead of fleeing to the other world, it gets, gets collapsed into history, and then we um, flee into the utopia that never really comes. I suppose you see this in Marx and Nietzsche in different ways. The Ubermensch never comes, or uh, the, the kind of utopia, the Marxist utopia never comes. Would you like to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, um, I think it's neo-Gnostic in that sense, sure. Um, it's not an escape from the world into a different spiritual realm, but it's it's a liberal, I mean, but it's, yeah, so it's neo-Gnostic in that sense, but it's Gnostic in the sense of it's a contempt for the body. I mean, that's, that just seems obvious uh, to me. Um, and so, I mean, I've, all you have to do like this, what I refer my students always to is they take a, there's a, so that's called a transhumanist reader. And you have all sort of the major figures in there giving short pieces, right? If people, if the audience is like, people are um, I mean, most of these are um, computing engineers anyway, so they don't know either how to write, nor do they write very, very long pieces, which is, you know, in our day and age, very refreshing, I suppose. Um, but you get a very good uh, and very quickly a sense of the, the Gnosticism, which basically is, um, you know, that the, that the uh, evolution hasn't done a great job. Right, evolution has produced like this bag of flesh that is, uh, you know, time time limited, ridden by disease, sort of has an entropy built in. Um, that obviously um, has got us this far. At least it's produced some form of consciousness. But we're going to take that now into our own hands uh, as engineers. And this is where, and you know, we're going to develop it into something much grander, much better, much more endurable. In fact, we're going to engineer ourselves into immortality. I mean, that's sort of the ultimate dream. And the problem with all of this is, as Paul pointed out earlier, uh, none of this will actually work. I mean, none of this can actually possibly happen. Like what you would possibly have. And I think, again, I mean, I can't say this often enough. It's just because I'm under the impression of just having reread the, the three pieces by C.S. Lewis, the space trilogy, instead of doing proper work. Um, but anyway, um, is, is that it'll end, this will end in complete disappointment and probably some form of violence. Um, because none of this can work. So it's it's a dystopia. And, it, and I'll just give you an example. I mean, what you always get is very slick, uh, slickly produced videos um, and Ray Kurzweil's sort of predictions of what will happen. Um, and they go from, we're now able to, let's say, stimulate broadly a brain area uh, with an electrical stimulus uh, to help, you know, um, uh, Parkinson's patients or Alzheimer patients or whatever. It's very crude. We go from that to, to reverse engineering the brain and uploading it um, onto a computing platform within five minutes. And, and, and the fact is that even if you could upload something, it certainly wouldn't be a human consciousness, right? It would be some kind of bizarre. And that just reminds me of this, the head in, uh, in C.S. Lewis's, right? It all people think they're constructing this thing, but it's really just a bloody imitation. It's nothing to do with with the reality of you know whatever is actually running the show. I think that's that's just so true of this whole transhumanist fiction. The problem with it is though, it already transforms how we view um, aging people, how we view childhood, how we view a whole bunch of things, including how we view gender and so on like all of this is now disposable all of this is boiled down to information all of this is interchangeable all of this is enhanceable um and and that's the tragedy because none of it is and so to go back back to paul's earlier thing where god really speaks is in in the you know organically grown human being that is transcending of itself um you know that has a nature 
in our interactions and in our social interactions. And the whole tenor of transhumanism is to transfigure that into something that's utterly abnormal. Uh, it will never work. It will become a mess. It's already becoming a mess, but people buy into it and it will slowly transfigure if we don't sort of pull back on it. Um, transfigures into, I don't know what, what, what you want to call it, like some form, some monstrosity it'll be. Yeah. Yeah. I, so one of the, one of the guys that we talk with and about sometimes in this little corner is Brett Weinstein, who no. is an interesting character in and of itself, but one of the, one of the guys in the Bridges of Meaning Discord, which is one of the communities that we've sort of gotten on, he, he noted right away, he said, you know, when you look at Brett's ontology, it's really very Gnostic because we have these we have these genocidal genes inside of us that are trying to get to the future and we sort of transcend them and say no to the genocidal dream genes. And, and that then is our, our salvific moment. Now, Brett would never use that term. And as a local church pastor in a, um, in a rather grimy little corner of Sacramento <laughs> over the last number of years, the, 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 place right outside my door here it's kind of a nice sidewalk hidden by bushes where a few junkies live and you know people want to use computers and everything for this self-transcendence it's like oh i don't know we've got meth and heroin and cocaine and um people do it all the time but we look at them and we say well i don't i don't think the junkie living outside my door is living his best life now why not um you know, we just have we just have more esoteric ideas about being uploaded into a server. Well, the guy the guy right here is sort of uploading himself into a heroin induced high, and his only problem is he has to come down. And so, you know, then suddenly visions of the early 20th century brave new world come to mind, where you have cots laid out of people protection, you know, continually on so much. These are these are not new ideas. And, and we've, we've seen them practiced with older technology, and we look at them and say no. And so when you see your teenager, you know, spending 15 hours a day playing a computer game, suddenly you say, I'm not quite sure that's a human being fully alive. Well, why not? And now this transhumanism, you're exactly right isn't going anywhere. I think that the difficulties we're going to face is, I love that conversation between Kings North and, and Mary Harrington. But, and, and they said, well, maybe the second conversation is we'll talk about solutions. Part of what really addles Brett Weinstein, mm -hmm. and this was very evident when he's talking to Jonathan Peugeot, is this the, the fight against this will not simply be a human fight. We will certainly participate in it, but all of these game B types out there who, who say, well, we need to establish technology that's going to renovate humanity so that we um, don't destroy ourselves either through environmental apocalypse or nuclear catastrophe or any of these possible um, end game solutions on us. Um, this it isn't going to be human beings that rescue us. We will participate in the rescue, but this then gets into again a much more biblical cosmology, where in fact, what's going on with human beings in this transhumanism is in fact spiritual by nature. Even if the vast majority of English language people, when pressed, can't really tell you what they mean by that word, hmm. but that there are other forces underway. And then suddenly Christians come in and say, well, Christ has overcome the world. And, and once people really hear that and see you're serious, they're probably going to say, well, what on earth do you mean he has overcome the world when the junkie's still outside my door and the transhumanists still have their aspirations? And I think that's where the church sort of has to not only embody, and this gets back to Bonhoeffer, life together, <laughs> the new community. Mm -hmm. But I think that will be the, the space in which Christians once again will bear witness to the life of Christ as they're doing it together. And mm -hmm. you realize that either hooked up to an IV drip or hooked up to a machine is not 
even to a casual observer how a human being ought to be. Mm, excellent. Thank you, Paul. And um, are you both okay to continue speaking for another while or do you have to go? I, I should probably land the plane. I got a couple of guys I got to tend to out there who are building a fence. <laughs> <laughs> Some people said I should name it Chesterton's fence. I said, no, we know why we're building this fence. <laughs> for each of you, is there anything that you're working on presently that you'd like to um, tell us about or plans for the future? I suppose if we start with yourself then, yet. Well, sure. That's always a sore spot. Yeah, I've got plenty of things I want to do and want to be doing, but um, like the uh, the business of, of teaching and working at the college kind of sometimes gets gets in between. But it's all good because the in between often is uh, often is inspiring as well. Um, so I'm I'm working still on a little intro book to Christian humanism, which I hope to write this this uh, summer. Um, so that's my utopia. Um, I'm working on a book on the person, which some of the stuff I hopefully flows into we have um i don't know paul if you know raymond Tallis. he's a um british um uh he's a, he did neuroscience on uh, with old people like he's a gerontologist but there's a lot of brain stuff um and uh he retired in 2006 from that work and he he's written a lot of books um but he defends humanity and the person and human identity against what he calls um neuromania and darwinitis um, and he really knows his stuff. So we have him, him come out uh, in May to give a lecture and to hang out with us here. So that's, that's going to be interesting. I'm very much looking forward to that. He's, a, he's an atheist, um, but uh, no surprise, he gets along best, I think, with religious folk who, you know, and the, and the humanists who still, want to, <laughs> who still want to be in person and want to celebrate, you know, the human being in flesh and blood. So um, I'm looking forward to that. That's sort of what's up. Thanks, Jens. Paul? Yeah. For me, I hope to get back to making videos after Holy Week. I just haven't had a lot of chance for um, a while, and we've got a bunch of projects on the ground. This summer, now it looks like COVID is, um, is increasingly not an encumbrance, and so we have our, our, our synod in the Christian Reformed Church will be, so I'm hoping to be able to do more in-person get-togethers. So we're going to have one in Chicago. We're going to have one in Grand Rapids. Um, the much anticipated one in Thunder Bay, Ontario, looks like it's back on the menu for September. So I'm hoping to get a little less virtual with this community that we've been gathering and get more and more in person. Um, we, we were actually going to, um, right in, in March of 2020, we were doing a West Coast tour and we did Arizona, Southern California. We're working our, our way up. We were gonna get all the way up to uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. And of course, COVID hit. So maybe, yeah. um, maybe when I get up to to Vancouver, we'll we'll be able to meet. I'll certainly see see Andrew then. So because you were well, let, let me know if you place. do. That'd be it'd be great to hang out. I mean, it'd be great to meet you. Um, yeah, you know, it was it was virtually pleasant, but it'd be probably more pleasant to meet you. Yeah. In person. <laughs> I, so BC is very much a, a place we wanna we wanna get together. We've got a lot of people around there. So okay, cool. Yeah, make sure you let me know when you come up. All right, I will do that. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank God for that. And um, I just want to say that anybody watching, just check out uh, Jens's web pages, uh, com that we mentioned and some of those fantastic resources there. And yeah, jenszimmerman.ca also, and Paul's YouTube channel, of course, and Substack. And thank you so much, Jens, and God bless you guys. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mark. No, I'm going there. Don't you want to go too?